Get to Old Navy now because this week only there's a new red hot deal every single day. Plus up to 50% off store wide. That's up to 50% off your favorite Old Navy styles. Also get $10 off your next purchase when you buy online and pick up in store. So hurry in and get today's wow worthy fashion pieces at a price you won't believe. Only at Old Navy. Valid 712 to 19. Select styles only. $10 off valid in store only. One time use. Excludes clearance, gift card, register lane items, jewelry. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 10. The road to hell is paved with works in progress. Philip Roth. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. So today, guys, we have a awesome guest, Michael Haig, the legendary Michael Haig. Michael Haig has been around as a screenwriting analyst and screenwriting guru for, God, the better part of a few decades now. And uh, he wrote the uh, the book that's on pretty much every screenwriter's shelves, Writing Screenplays That Sell, The Complete Guide to Turning Story Concepts into Movie and Television Deals. Michael's list of clients is pretty impressive. He's worked with every single major studio and television network around. He has clients like Will Smith, who he helped work on, I Am Legend, Hancock, The Karate Kid, and recently he's worked with uh, Columbia Pictures on the Masters of the Universe reboot, uh, among many other projects he's been working on with the studio. So he is an amazing uh, teacher and story analyst, story cons- uh, script consultant, and I was I was trying to get him on the show for months, and we finally got him on, and we asked him all the tough, tough, tough questions. I, I discovered Michael through a course that he put out years ago called The Hero's Two Journeys, which he actually co-authored with Chris Volger, of Writer's Journey, who is an other, another amazing guru uh, in the screenwriting field. And what we decided to do is Michael and I and Chris wanted to bring the Heroes 2 journeys to the indie film hustle audience, the tribe. So what we've decided to do is put it all together and package it into a new course called Screenwriting and Story Blueprint, the Heroes 2 journeys. This course is a must for any screenwriter. It is a wonderful course that really breaks down the story structure of the hero's journey, which Chris Volger is famous for, and Michael's six-stage plot structure. And they both go in it back-to-back, kind of in really breaking down these amazing uh, story structures for filmmakers, for screen screenwriters. And when I saw it, it just blew me away, and I've been a fan of Michael uh, and Chris's ever since. So uh, if you want to get a special deal on this new course, uh, at the end of this podcast, I will be giving you guys a link to go to so you can get it for a lot cheaper than it's going to be retailing for. So without further ado, here is my interview with Michael Haig. Michael, man, thank you so much for uh, being on the Indie Film Hustle podcast. I really appreciate you taking out the time. Oh, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> so um, tell me, how did you get started in the crazy film business? <laughs> <laughs> the crazy business. Um well, basically, uh, I grew up in Oregon, and I had moved back there after getting a master's in education, and I taught school for three years, but I'd always dreamed of working in the film business, having no idea what that would involve or anything <laughs> about it, but I just always loved movies, and I figured 
it's time, if I'm going to give this a try, I better get it going. So I sort of jumped on the turnip truck and went down to Hollywood and moved there, discovered a small film school that I started going to and took a variety of classes. And one of those was in what was formerly known as story analysis, which is just the term for being a reader in Hollywood, meaning you read scripts for agents or producers or studios and you write a synopsis of each script and then you give your comment where you tell them this is terrible you don't want anything to do with this so and then you give it to them so they don't have to take the time to read a lot of bad scripts mostly but it's an entry-level job and after I learned how to do that I I sort of cold called about a hundred different agencies and finally found one that gave me a shot and I became their reader and then moved over to being the reader for one of their clients who was a producer he made me his head of development. That's just the next rung up, which mm -hmm. means I'm now working full time reading scripts for him and working with writers and finding story ideas and so on. And it sort of went from there. Then I worked for a couple other producers and that led to me on the side teaching at UCLA Extension, mm -hmm. uh, teaching screenwriting. Out of that grew a weekend seminar that I ended up taking over around the world. And out of that grew my book and my consultation business. And that's pretty much where I am now. I still consult with writers and filmmakers and storytellers and uh, lecture about screenwriting. Very cool. Very cool. In your book, um, your book, uh, writing, uh, writing the Screenplay That Sells, Writing Correct. screenplays that sell. Correct. Yes, that Correct. one's now the 20th anniversary? Yeah, it's it's past that now. We I did a new edition, mm -hmm. the 20-year 20, 20 mark, and I think that was a couple of years ago. So it's gone to 22, 22 years. about since the first edition came out. And, and then since then, I wrote another book on pitching called Selling Your Story in 60 Seconds uh, and other products and so on. But those two books are the mainstay. I took, um, I took your course, the... The Heroes Two Journeys, the <clears throat> the DVD course, I guess oh, it was. Right, right. That's how I got familiar with your work, and I took that years ago, and it was wonderful. And now we are all we are all familiar with the Heroes Journey, but you talk extensively about the Heroes Two Journeys. What do you mean by that? Well, to me, the way the best way to break down a story or look at story is that there are actually two goals or two journeys, if you will, that the hero of the story takes. One is a journey of accomplishment. The hero wants to cross some finish line, wants to achieve some visible goal, and then they pursue that through the course of the story. It's a very visible thing. It drives the action. It's what we see on the screen. So it might be stopping a serial killer or an alien invasion or finding a buried treasure or winning the love of the girl or the guy or or. Uh, whatever mm -hmm. escaping from ba some bad situation. It's always something that when we hear that goal, we can envision what achieving it would look like. But underneath that, on most movies, not all, uh, some big action movies don't have this, but in most movies, there's a second journey that's under that. It's an invisible journey. It's what I call a journey of transformation. Mm -hmm. And that second journey is one where the hero's conflict comes from within, where they are battling or must overcome some long and deep-seated fear, usually that grows out of something in the past. And until they can overcome that fear and find the courage to change, they're not going to achieve the visible goal. And so what I talk about mm -hmm. is the way those two things intertwine, uh, that visible journey and then that inner journey of transformation. So it's kind of like the subtext of the character's development in, in itself, kind of like the hidden the hidden part of it, of yeah, what he's trying exactly. to do. It's the character's arc. <clears throat> Got you. And the thing, and sometimes the character doesn't even know he has that arc until later in the story. He kind of develops it. I, I, I guess kind of like us in life. We all have our our inner journeys and our inner issues, and then we don't know that we even have them until later on in life or things come to us to kind of expose these problems or these issues. Like, oh, uh, that's why you're so angry because you didn't go to that party when you were in third grade or something along those lines. Yeah. It's usually, it's usually not something you didn't do, but something that was done or happened to you uh, that causes what I call the wound. It's that painful or traumatic event, or sometimes it's an ongoing situation, usually from adolescence doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. but a good example I like to use is goodwill hunting where yeah. he was abused by his father 
got a belt taken to him throughout his whole adolescence, apparently. So now that he's a grown up, he uh, and he falls in love. He wants to win the love of Skylar. And he does what he thinks he needs to do to do that, but he's never really going to achieve that goal unless he can overcome his fear of letting people see who he truly is, of letting her in, because he's afraid that he deserved that beating and he's a worthless person. Now, he's not aware of that. As you said, this Mm -hmm. is... This is hidden from ourselves. This is we develop this emotional armor and it's such strong armor that we think that's who we really are. So it takes the course of the movie for the hero to recognize, oh, this is what I'm really dealing with. And this is what I'm going to have to change about myself to accomplish that goal. And in that movie, that transformation is facilitated by Sean, the Robin Williams character, who helps him see that inner conflict that identity that he's taken on and help him overcome it and that's why at the end well spoiler alert i gotta go see about a girl yes that's exactly it (laughs) he finally he he finally figures it out and says hey i'm gonna go and i guess you know as i've i keep reading screenplays and watching movies and the best ones are those deep-seated the when the character actually not not doesn't beat the bad guy but beats the bad guy within himself almost you know and kind of like just like that that's why goodwill hunting is such a wonderful film and we everyone's so uh you know um what's the word um identifies with will because it's you know that that inner struggle i think is makes characters much more powerful than just the big strong guy that goes around you know beating up the bad guys in so many ways. I mean, precisely because, yeah, we may not have been beaten as a child. <laughs> sure. We may not have fallen in love, but there, we always believe that there's a part of us we can't show to the world. We always believe there's a part of us that isn't worthy or or that shouldn't be revealed or that we're terrified of connecting of someone else and really being that vulnerable. So that's the universal experience. And then it's just particularized in the story or in any good story that any screenplay that any of your listeners are writing. Mm-hmm. It's One of the key questions I always want a writer to ask about their script is, what terrifies my hero? And I'm not talking about fear Mm -hmm. of heights or snakes. Or aliens, right, right. What what is the emotional fear? What What is the wall that I refuse to cross over or break down no matter how much I want this goal because it's just too scary. And when a writer can figure out this is what terrifies my hero, then they're going to get in touch with that inner conflict and that inner journey that the hero takes. And I just think it makes the story much richer and, as you say, much more universal. Now, uh, besides Goodwill Hunting, can you throw one more example out of another one? That, that kind of grasp that? Yeah. 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 If you give me t- – I could throw out a hundred. <laughs> um, let me go through a few. In Rain Man, his uh, wound was his brother died. His No, his brother was taken away. His mother died and his father abandoned him. So now his belief is that anybody I get close to is going to disappear. Now, again, I want to emphasize it's not conscious. It's not like if you said to uh, – uh, Charlie Babbitt, well, you know, what are you afraid of? And he'd say that he's he's completely oblivious to it because it's become so much a part of who he is or how he sees himself. But his belief is anybody I get close to will disappear. So his terror is of getting close to anybody. And then he meets this brother and his reaction to his brother is not to embrace him and say, oh, wow, I've got a brother. It's to just exploit the guy and mm-hmm. terrify this brother because all he really wants at the beginning is his inheritance. But in the course of the journey, what he does is he finds the courage step by step and gradually to connect with the brother and comes to realize, even if I get close to this guy, he's not going to disappear. I don't need to be afraid of that consciously or subconsciously. Mm-hmm. And that's his arc. That's his growth. And when he does that, in that case, it's not that he achieves the goal, it's he becomes mature enough to let go of that goal, give up on that inheritance, and find a better goal, which is to help his brother. And, and the brilliance about that specific movie is that um, Dustin Hoffman's character, he, he, he can't be hurt by what Tom Cruise's character is doing to him because he is autistic. So he, like all these things that – like kind of the, the berating – that he does, I guess he doesn't get affected by it. So even more so, it's kind of like looking in a mirror almost with um, with Tom Cruise's characters. Like he can't 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 hurt him. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't agree with that because yeah. the thing is he can hurt Raymond by frightening him so badly. You're right. You're right. Really ill equipped to deal with the world. Ray, here's here's the parallel I see. It's a char- it's a story about a character who has to learn to feel by being with someone who is incapable of expressing emotion, uh, incapable of connecting with another person physiologically. And so, but through that character, the to- the Tom Cruise character Charlie Babbitt learns to express his feelings and connect with another person in a way the brother who taught him that is incapable of doing. Excellent point. Excellent point. Now, what are, what are the elements of a great scene? A great scene. A great scene. Mm-hmm. Well, I think first of all, it has to have the, the key foundation elements that any overall story has. And that is, it has to be built on character, desire, and conflict. In other words, in a good scene, not just the hero of the story or the main character in the scene, but everyone in that scene must want something. Mm-hmm. And then, the you know, let's say the scene is involves the hero of the story, and he's the one that's driving this movie or driving this goal that moves us along in the story, then... Whatever it is he wants, or whatever it is the other characters want, by and large, there must be something standing in their way. There has to be some conflict to be overcome, primarily because your goal as a screenwriter, your number one goal as a storyteller of any kind, uh, because I work with internet marketers, and I work with public speakers, and I work with novelists, and so on, the goal of any storyteller has to be to elicit emotion, and emotion grows out of conflict, not desire. Mm-hmm. Desire doesn't re- isn't really emotionally involving. That just is the engine that drives the story. It's the obstacles the character has to overcome that make the story involving and actually make a story sound commercial as far as that goes. So within each scene, you want to say, okay, who? Wh- how does this scene relate to my hero and that hero's outer journey? How does this move the hero closer to his goal or create more obstacles to it? And then what does every character in this scene want? And then if possible, what you want to do is take some of those characters if, and put them in opposition. So they want opposing things. That's what's going to create greater conflict in the scene. Sometimes the scene is not about characters in conflict with each other, but teaming together to face some other obstacle, some force of nature or some villain that's on the way or some, some opponent that has to be overcome. Mm-hmm. But it's always about what is that conflict? What is that conflict going to be? And then... The last thing I would say that's absolutely essential to every scene is you must create anticipation. You want to end every scene with the reader anticipating, okay, what's going to happen next? You want to create a question. Okay, now I see where this particular sequence ended. I see where the hero is now. They're somewhere that they weren't at the beginning, but now what are they going to do about X? Now what's the next step they're going to take? Or now how are they going to face this villain that I just saw a scene where the villain's planning to kill them or whatever it might be. So you always want to force your reader to turn the page or to move to the next scene and try and guess what's going to happen next. Now, Michael, when you're saying conflict, and uh, obviously conflict is an integral part of every great movie and every great scene. I've heard from a lot of different um, gurus, teachers, uh, instructors, um, analysts on story that the one story that uh, really never had the main character didn't have conflict was Forrest Gump. Now, I'm not sure if that's true or not. There's conflict all around him, but he personally never had it. It, it, Can you explain to me whether that's true or not or what your take on that is? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I I must confess, my take is that just sounds bizarre. Tell me. I could not see that he has conflict. Let's take the main through line. What is his main desire in that entire movie? Oh, that would be getting Jenny. Getting Jenny. And Jenny keeps getting separated from him and he tries to get her and then she gets involved with others. And, and it's, it seems like always, always it's let's get back to her 
And whenever he encounters her, there's something standing between them. It's, it's, it's like a love story, but she gets involved with the protesters, the hippies in the late 60s, or whatever else it might be. So there's that. And then there's the fact that when he goes to Vietnam, he, the, the bombs are blasting all around him, and he's got to save the, save the life mm-hmm. of Captain Dave. Is that his uh, name? Captain, I, uh, Captain I haven't oh. seen the movie in more than a decade. I know, I know. So uh, Lieutenant John, to you know, Lieutenant. Oh, I God. think maybe I think maybe it's hard to recognize what his overall goal is because it's a very very episodic story. Very, and because. What happens is he seems to overcome the obstacles he faces fairly easily and then go on and have a big effect on other characters. But I would not definitely not say there's not conflict, that there aren't obstacles for him to overcome or that the audience isn't wondering how is he going to do this Mm -hmm. or how is he going to be able to – make money get you know on for Bubba shrimp or whatever it right, might, right. that he's trying to do. So either either the answer, the short answer would be I don't know. I don't understand the question. Sure. Or the answer would be they're wrong. There's lots of obstacles for him to overcome in that movie. Now that you've explained it in that way, I, I completely and totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a long movie, so I'm thinking, what about his mother and the fact that his mother's dying? I mean, he is able to overcome those obstacles, but so is the hero of any movie. They just go on to something bigger. And but, I, I, but I think the key is look at the relationship with Jenny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And Jenny is his main goal, and it's that's it. That's, And I think maybe it's because there's so much other stuff going on around him, and he's in every historical you know, area, and you know, you know, every, he does so many different things. That you kind of lose track sometimes. At the end of the day, the course he just wants to be with Jenny. Period. Yeah. That's well, it. There's another. There's another thing we should point out too, mm-hmm. and that is the movie's a biography. Mm-hmm. It's and biographies do not follow um, the same kind of structure that other films do. I I usually say that the I don't know if it's the most difficult to write, but the least commercial genre is a biography. And what I mean by a biography is the birth to death story of someone's life, Mm -hmm. or at least birth to, you know, as far along as Forrest Gump gets in that story. Mm -hmm. Because let's take a movie like The King's Speech. The King's Speech is a true story about George the Mm third. And but it's not a biography, because we don't see him being born and Mm -hmm his childhood and so on. We learn of those things as backstory through dialogue, but it's basically a story about a guy who has a single goal. And that is he wants to give a speech without stuttering. Right. Okay. And his, the whole movie is about how is he going to be able to do that with the help of Lionel Logue until the speech becomes not just important to him, but important to the whole country because it's got to lead England into world war two. Mm-hmm. So that's not my definition of biography, but if you take a movie, like uh, Chaplin, mm-hmm. Amelia Earhart. I, I, I guess that was called uh, Amelia. Was Amelia. I, think, yeah. well, I forget what the title was. Mm-hmm. Or or other movies like that. And notice Malcolm uh, X. All movies these things, that sure. generally speaking are not do not do well at the box office. Then what they do is they'll have an obstacle and then they'll overcome it, and then an obstacle and overcome it. And it's sort of like, well, here are pieces strung together into this person's life. And the reason those are generally not commercial, I believe, is because audiences want a singular finish line that they're rooting for that hero to cross. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Forrest Gump adds the thread of Jenny that runs through that otherwise biography that is about one incident or one goal after another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you take a movie like Braveheart, Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. The whole s- story of his life is toward one goal, and that is freedom for Scotland. Or Gandhi is about freedom for from England for India. Mm-hmm. And those biographies are those true stories about real characters who have a singular goal that you can follow – Um, creates a much more familiar and stronger spine, I believe, than just what you'd call life stories. And so I always recommend you find the one 
particular incident in the person's life where they had the biggest goal or the most compelling goal and make the story about that. And perhaps because of that, people are not recognizing the, the conflict in, in Forrest Gump the same way because they're forgetting it's a biography that's going to be segmented into one goal after another. Right. And generally our lives are not about one singular goal. It's about multiple yeah. little goals. That's why. Yeah. That's why movies are better than real life. <laughs> Right. Your life is not properly structured. It's like <laughs> you know? my goal is to get and, to the supermarket and get. Well, or as I like to say, real life is shit happens and then you die, and that's <laughs> really a good movie. Not like, ge- not generally, not generally. Like our goals now are like I need to go to the supermarket and get this. Oh, the crackers are out. Shoot, yeah. there's <laughs> conflict. There's an obstacle. But not 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 very exciting though. Not very exciting. But freedom from from England. That's that's a much more grandiose uh, goal in life (laughs) and and also that's another good thing to point out that movies are not successful either artistically or commercially because of the size of the goal it's only the size of the conflict for the hero that makes a difference so there's nothing Mm -hmm. inherently bigger or more important about freedom for england than there is surviving on mars or um Good will hunting. I love right. falling in love with someone who's an inflatable sex doll. Well, I'm giving away an answer to a later question I think <laughs> you're going to ask. But it's, it's always what makes it seem impossible for the hero mm-hmm. to accomplish this goal. So what that goal is is only important in that it gives the story its forward thrust and gives the opportunity for those obstacles. Very well put. Very well put. Now, I'm sure you've read a few scripts in your day. Uh, <laughs> a couple, three, yeah. A couple, two or three. Uh, what are some of the common problems you see with first-time screenwriters and, and like kind of first-time scripts? Well, the number one problem, I think, overall is the writer has not given nearly enough thought to, is this commercial? Yeah. It's... The writer is assuming, apparently, that because this story sounds intriguing to him or to her, or because it's something that happened to them that was fascinating, or because, you know, it makes for a good story around the dinner table, this is something that a million people are going to be willing to pay to see. And that just most of the time is not the case. And while I agree On an emotional level or a psychological level, you want to write about what you know. What I think is more important is when you come up with a story idea, ask yourself, is there any movie I can point to that's made money in the last year or anything that is advertised in today's paper that's playing at the Regal Cinema or the Arclight or whatever that this is similar to? that this is in the same genre, that this is going to appeal to the mass audience in the same way. And I think that uh, a lot more uh, respect or attention needs to be paid to, is this really something that's going to make money? Because I'm assuming that anyone listening who's a screenwriter wants to be a writer because you want to be heard. You want your stories to be seen as films. And For a movie to get made is going to cost a lot of money and somebody's got to put up that money and they can't invest that money unless they think it's going to turn a profit. And because movies are expensive, unlike books, which you can publish for pretty cheaply, movies have to have a lot of people buying tickets or tuning in if it's a TV show or subscribing to Netflix if it's that in order for that movie to turn a profit. And so you have to be able to build into that story or build that story on a, one that has a good possibility of making money. And I just feel like lots of writers are not thinking about that. They just, it's like for their own edification. Right. Then, let's say that hurdle is passed. Let's say they have found a high concept story or, or let's say they found a movie that is, Uh, within a genre that's generally commercial, let's say. Then the key problems are more within the way the story is told. One difficulty I see frequently, and this is not limited to new writers. I I encounter this with million-dollar screenwriters. The story is just simply too complicated. Yeah. Another thing to remember about movies, especially if – 
you're pursuing a Hollywood career, if you're talking about pursuing a Hollywood financing, a mainstream movie for this country, um, they're very simple. I mean, Hollywood stories are built on very simple ideas. There is, I would guess, not a single movie playing in theaters right now that came out of Hollywood that I could not, with three minutes of thought, express the storyline in a single sentence. Log lines, you know, basically. You know, it's yeah. it's simple. Now, it doesn't mean the characters aren't layered. It doesn't mean the characters can't be complex. It doesn't mean that there aren't lots of obstacles to overcome. It's just at the level of story concept, you know, what is it? A group of reporters wants to find out the truth or report the truth about uh, the sex scandal in the Catholic Church. A guy stranded on Mars wants to stay alive until he can be rescued in a year and a half. It's... Uh, you name it, whatever movie is out there, whatever is is doing well or even getting made, it's based on a simple story. And then it's not about going off on a lot of tangents or making that complicated. It's about keeping that straight through line and then creating interesting and different and increasingly difficult obstacles for those characters to overcome. Now, and then the final thing, mm -hmm. the, the last thing, and this is in a way, the simplest, but it's just too many scripts I read are not professionally presented. Right. It's like they're not properly formatted, which astonishes me because I've been around long enough that when I started, there were no, there was no such thing. There was barely computers. Mm -hmm. There was certainly no such thing as Final Draft or Movie Magic Screenwriter, and you had to sort of set the margins on your typewriter and things like that. But now, all you got to do is invest in a formatting program, and you're pretty much home free mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. And all you have to do is use spell checkers or get somebody who knows English to check it for spelling and grammar. And I see a lot of those errors in new scripts, and it's like, come on, spend 24 hours doing a little research or spend a buck to get the program and you can make this look as good as any other script floating around Hollywood. So those three things, I think, it's simplicity, professionally presented, and most of all, commercial. So Michael, uh, uh, you mentioned the, the term high concept. Can you explain to the audience what a high concept and low concept are? Yeah, well... I, I haven't really heard the term low concept before, but high concept gets bandied about a lot. And people have different definitions of it. But here's mine. A high concept idea is one that an audience will line up or tune in to see the movie or the TV series just based on what the log line is, just based on what that movie is about on a plot level. And high concept stories promise big conflict. Mm -hmm. So a good example recently of a high concept movie that did very, very well was The Martian. Mm -hmm. Because it's about a guy who gets stranded on Mars and now somehow has to survive and face all of the elements on this foreign planet and stay alive long enough that the people on Earth can send a spaceship to rescue him, let's say. So it sounds like the obstacles are going to be big. It's a genre kind of film, not just science fiction, but it's about someone needing to escape from a bad situation. Now, it comes with a stellar cast, and it got great reviews, and it's going to get nominated for Oscars and so on, but a high concept does not depend on those things. Mm -hmm. High concepts are ideas that it doesn't matter who directed it, who's starring in it, what kind of reviews, what kind of word of mouth, or what kind of awards it gets. It's just the story idea. So Jaws, Speed, those would be typical high concept kind of ideas. If a movie is much smaller, let's take another movie that's get, gonna get a number of Oscar nominations that was also one of my favorite movies this year called Room, mm -hmm. okay? That's a story about a mother who's raised a child from birth in a nine foot by nine foot room and the child's never seen the outside. So it's how would they, what would happen in that situation and then what would happen if they had the opportunity to go into the outside world? wonderful movie, but I don't think when you hear that story idea, you say, yeah, I've got to see that. That sounds exciting. That sounds like, 
an edgier seat suspense. Right. So that movie was released slowly. You can usually tell when a movie's not as high a concept because the release pattern will be just a few theaters and then a little more, a little more, because they want the word of mouth to build. Because movies that aren't high concept, low concept, as you, as you say, are dependent on criticism, on reviews, on word of mouth, on promotion and publicity, on the stars that might be in that story. Now, one last thing I want to say about high concept. It has absolutely nothing to do with artistic quality. You can have a high concept movie that's great. Martian is an example of that, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You can have a high concept movie that is absolutely dreadful. And you can have a low budget, arty, not high concept story that's great, and you can have another one that's dreadful. Mm -hmm. We're not. We're only talking about a commercial issue here. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Now, do you have any tips on uh, to, to screenwriters on how they can get their screen screenplays actually read? <laughs> Well, yeah, um, I, I kind of I wrote a whole book about it, actually, too. <laughs> so it's a, it's a tough question because it's so big. There's so many different things that one can do and to consider. And in those two books we talked about, the, the book on pitching is all about how do you describe your story in 60 seconds so that somebody would want to read it. And writing screenplays that sell has a whole marketing section. Mm-hmm. But – Be that as it may, what I'd say most succinctly is the smartest thing you can do to market your script is to follow in the footsteps of those who've done it before. Okay. And the way you do that is you, first of all, besides reading as much as you can, interviews with screenwriters, especially newer ones. I mean, it's fine to hear the story of how William Goldman became a screenwriter, but it's got nothing to do with you. I mean, that was decades ago, and he's now hugely successful. Those are the, inter- those are the screenwriters that usually get interviewed. But anytime you can see in a film magazine or on your podcast, if you interview someone who's new but has managed to cross over and broken in – Those are the people who have the stories about how they did it that are going to be most valuable. And you want to follow in their footsteps, meaning uh, they might have uh, entered contests. They might have gone to pitch marts. They might have composed great uh, cover letters or emails. What they have all done, though, there are two things they would all have in common. One is they write. They write and they write and they write. I've never seen a successful screenwriter that didn't write regularly. That's not a marketing tool. It's just you've got to keep writing even while you're marketing one script to keep working on the other. And the other thing they did is network. And by that I mean they found situations where they could meet other people that could provide them with either more net, more contacts or information on how to reach those people. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, what you want to do is you want to target the people you're going after. Uh, Some screenwriters who are trying to break in, they get that Writers Guild list of all the agencies, and they either limit themselves to the ones with asterisks who say, well, we will look at unsolicited material, which is a mistake because those are usually not very powerful agencies, or they send a a mass email to everybody, or they buy email lists and send it to everybody, and that just doesn't make sense because 90% of the production companies in Hollywood are probably not going to be interested or be able to mount your particular script. What you want to do is look at movies that are similar, go to a website called the Internet Movie Database, find out who the producers of those movies are, and then contact the heads of development for those companies because – if, if whatever company produced The Martian, I mean, it's certainly Scott Free because yeah, really crazy. Scott directed it, but there are other companies involved. They obviously have been able to and are interested in bigger budget, exciting action kinds of films. You probably wouldn't pursue those companies with room. That movie I was just describing is very low budget, independent, small movie, and so on. You may, if they've done other things like that, but figure out what movies yours is similar to and then go after the people who've made those movies before. Um, And a couple of rules, too, as you're doing this. Um, One is 
as I said, you want to keep writing. You never want to stop writing just so you can mark it. And the other is never wait for somebody else to keep moving forward. Don't send your script to somebody and even to say, I'll get right back to you. Don't wait until they get right back to you before you start pursuing other people. Just always keep going after as many appropriate producers, agents, managers, or production companies as you can until you find the one that really is willing to make a deal with you. So, Michael, what was the lesson that took you the longest to learn in the film business? I don't know if this is what you're going for because it's not really a lesson about screenwriting or even necessarily the business. It's a little bigger than that. But the lesson that I wish I had learned sooner is that the best way, the best path to take is to concentrate on the things that I loved and repeatedly eliminate the parts of what I'm doing that I wasn't enjoying. In other words, focus on what I wanted or what I loved and not what I thought other people thought I should be doing. Because for a long time when I came to Hollywood, I was trying to sort of break in or move up the ladder doing existing jobs or doing them the way other people did. I I felt for a while, well, I, I know I can teach this, but I should be a screenwriter, even though I didn't really have a desire to write scripts myself. I liked working with other writers. Mm-hmm. Or I should be getting a development job at a studio, or I should be doing this. Or then when I became a consultant, there were things about it I didn't like. I didn't like writing synopses, and I didn't like actually writing much of anything. And so over the years, what I realized is I could just eliminate the things I didn't like and it wouldn't it would actually enhance my career because the more i limited that i didn't like doing the more successful i became as a consultant and as a speaker and so on until now when i do consultations it's what i love to do because i like interacting with writers i like to feel like a collaborator i like long sessions not mm-hmm. quick ones i hate doing notes i like sitting down with people in the industry and hashing through the projects. I like speaking to groups that have invited me to come, but I don't like advertising my own seminars and I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's a broader um, lesson from that for anyone, it's make sure that whatever path you're on to keep checking and say, is this still bringing me joy? And if the answer is at all no, or if part of it is not, say, is there a way to adjust what I'm doing so I get more of the joy and less of the seemingly necessary pain to get there? Now, it doesn't mean in the early stages of your career as a screenwriter or anything else, there aren't dues to be paid and there isn't some grunt work you got to go through. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, you're going to find that there are things you're doing that make it worthwhile and other things that you feel like you got to put up with. And the more you can let go of the put up with stuff and the more you can stay with the worthwhile stuff, I think in the long run, you'll certainly be happier and probably more successful. That entire answer should be on a (laughs) t-shirt. For fat people? I was about to say, you're going to have to have a a very large face. Bumper sticker. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, uh, this is a question I always ask all of my uh, my guests. What was the most underrated film you've ever seen? Um, I, uh, we should tell people, I, I was cued for this. You sent me this one in advance so yes. I could think about it. And I, it probably wouldn't have been hard to come up with because I use this movie as an example all the time. It's a movie called Lars and the Real Girl. Oh, love that movie. And It may be wrong to say it was underrated because Nancy Oliver, who wrote the script, actually was nominated for an Oscar. So that's not underrated and it got good reviews, but it didn't do business. I mean, Mm -hmm. very few people went to see it. And I consider it one of the great romantic comedies um, ever. I just love talking about this movie. And I think the reason very few people saw it is because the logline is (laughs) it's about a guy who falls in love with a sex doll. (laughs) And so it sounds either 
seamy or kind of distasteful or some broad R-rated comedy, none of which it is. I mean, it's one of the sweetest, actually most spiritual kind of movies. It has just a great love story at its core. It's one I love to talk about. I've actually done lectures just about that movie. And this is a chance for me to recommend everyone who's listening, find it and see it. It's called Lars and the Real Girl. Yeah, with uh, Ryan Gosling. It's uh, He was awesome in that movie. It was a great, great film. I love that movie. So, Michael, what are your top three films of all time? Okay. Well, I want to tell your listeners, just by way of excuse, just like the last one, you warned me that this was going to be a a question. Yes. And so I emailed you back and said, I don't want that question. (laughs) Yes. And I I begged you to answer it. But we do this in every broadcast. And I said, okay, um, what's what's my uh, favorite movie? What was... what was, it? was the question my three favorite films? Yeah, top, yeah no, no okay. specific order. So here's my answer. I was incapable of doing that. So here's what the answer I came up with. The, way, the only way I could get even close was if I segmented them. Okay. Okay, so you're going to have to put up with like nine titles. Fair here, enough, right? fair okay. enough. The first thing I thought is in terms of favorite movies, what are the three classic movies that I consider just absolutely great films that were very formative for me that maintain after all these years? They're still great movies. And the three I came up with were Casablanca, Mm -hmm. still probably the greatest love story Hollywood has ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, Psycho, still perhaps the scariest movie Hollywood has ever done. And Hitchcock's best, I think, unlike mm-hmm. Vertigo, that most people uh, regard. And finally, The Godfather, which if I had to pick the great Hollywood movie, I would probably pick that one. Yeah. So those are the three favorites in terms of these are great, great movies by any measure. I don't know how they could be improved. Mm-hmm. Then I thought, OK, the second set is what are three movies that are my favorites because they meant a lot to me personally as I was growing up or as I was falling in love with movies? And the three I picked for that were, uh, number one, uh, Bye Bye Birdie, Mm -hmm. because not not a great movie, although some great uh, numbers, but because it was a movie that, first movie I remember having a crush on the star, because once Margaret got on that treadmill, I was lost forever, Mm -hmm. that I saw repeatedly, that I just loved and and, uh, was just... And, and that I remember going back to see multiple times. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, it's sort of beyond guilty pleasure to just I apologetically say <laughs> it's just a lot to me. The second yeah. one was uh, Miracle on 34th Street, mm-hmm. uh, my favorite, I think still probably the best Christmas movie, much better than It's a Wonderful Life, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that meant a lot to me because I always loved Christmas, but because at one point in my life, I was a department store Santa myself, and I tried to model myself after Edmund Gwen in Miracle on 34th Street. So this is probably more information than your listeners. No, but that's that's a very cool story. Okay, and the third one is A Fistful of Dollars. It's a movie, my favorite Western ever, although if you take that whole Man With No Name trilogy, it'd be hard to pick. But that was an important movie to me. Maybe this is more career as well as personal because – it's. I saw it when I was just starting to take some film classes. They didn't have filmmaking at the University of Oregon when I went there, but they had like a film appreciation or a film studies class. And I was learning about all these big name directors and I happened to see it and I started noticing a lot going on in the movie underneath the plot. And I actually took notes and, and sort of composed this whole analysis of what was going on underneath. And that's when I think I really internalized the idea that there's the plot of a movie and then there's all the layers underneath that can be added that are not instead of an exciting, in this case, action-filled Western or plot or superficial story, if you want to say that, but grow out of that and are intertwined with that uh, to make it terrific. So that was the second group. And then the last group that was impossible was really probably what you're asking, and that is, what are my Desert Island movies? What are the movies that I could see again and again and again? And the three I came up with, although with 
If you gave me another day, I'd probably come up with six <laughs> different ones. One is Sleepless in Seattle okay. because it's probably still my favorite romantic comedy. It also meant a lot to my career because it was the first movie I ever lectured about in its totality at a, at a seminar, at a conference once. And as I was in the middle of the lecture, I noticed in the back of the room was Jeff Arch who wrote it. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, I'm talking about his script. And afterwards he came up and said, everything you said about that movie was what I wanted people to get. And we've been friends ever since. So oh, that was cool. cool. So I picked that, um, the Bourne trilogy for action movies, the, all three of the Bourne identity, Bourne, mm -hmm. you know, supremacy and mm -hmm. so on. And, um, finally, um, love actually, which oh, combines Christmas and romantic comedy. And one of my all time favorite writers, Richard Curtis. And I just think is a movie that I could see, once a year and often do and uh, still like it. So that's the best I could do with three movies. <laughs> that was actually one of the, the best answers to that question we've had on the show. Well, it's because I cheated. See, I, it's I, went outside, I drew outside the line. <laughs> All right. So last question, where can people find you? Um, actually, there's only one place people need to go to find out about my coaching about the products I've created, including my books and the Heroes Two Journeys that you mentioned, and also read a lot of articles and uh, question and answers I've done. And that's to my website. It's storymastery.com, S-T-O-R-Y, and then mastery with a Y on the end, storymastery.com. And if you go there, there's a lot of things that you can link to and see that I think will sort of expand on some of the questions you ask me and other things about everything to do with the storytelling, actually, not just screenwriting. I, I will definitely put links to all of uh, to put. I'll put a link to that into show notes. Michael, thank you so much for, uh, for being on the show. We you've thrown out a lot of great gold nuggets. So thank you. Oh, good. Well, thank you for having me. It was an honor and great fun. I enjoyed this a lot. And uh, if we do it again, I'll come up with three different movies or nine different movies for you. How's that? Thank you so much. I really love talking to Michael. It was it was it was a treat to really get to know Michael and and now work with him a little bit, putting this new course together, the story and screenplay blueprint. So uh, as promised, I'm going to give you guys the link to get the course, which will be retailing for sixty seven dollars but you're going to get it for 25 bucks and it'll be 25 bucks for a little while. So you have to hurry and get it quick before we, we before the, uh, the sale runs out, but it is a launch. So all you have to do is go to indiefilmhustle.com forward slash story blueprint. That's indiefilmhustle.com forward slash story blueprint. And that will give you guys directly a link to uh, the course at 25 bucks. So definitely check it out, guys. I think you really will get a lot out of it. And to get links to anything we discussed in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS010. And if you haven't already, head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com and sign up and subscribe to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast on iTunes. It really, really helps us get the word out on this podcast and gets this information into more screenwriters' hands. So as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com. Get to Old Navy now because this week only there's a new red hot deal every single day. Plus up to 50% off store wide. That's up to 50% off your favorite Old Navy styles. Also get $10 off your next purchase when you buy online and pick up in store. So hurry in and get today's wow worthy fashion pieces at a price you won't believe. Only at Old Navy. Valid 712 to 19 select styles only. $10 off valid in store only. One time use excludes clearance, gift card, register lane items, jewelry. Get to Old Navy now, because this week only, there's a new red-hot deal every single day. Plus, up to 50% off store-wide. That's up to 50% off your favorite Old Navy styles. Also, get $10 off your next purchase when you buy online and pick up in-store. So hurry in and get today's wow-worthy fashion pieces at a price you won't believe. Only at Old Navy. Valid 712 to 19, select styles only. $10 off valid in-store only. One-time use excludes clearance, gift card, register lane items, jewelry.